the Lord has put it on my heart to talk again about heaven's perspectives. And one of the perspectives from heaven, and I really want to try to clear, you know, clear this up, is I want to talk today about sufferings. Now, it's not something that I wanted to talk about. Actually, I had to go through suffering in order to start teaching on sufferings today. I had to be obedient in that. We've had a very, very trying week and a half. Um, we've, we've lost people. Um, we've had many people that all of a sudden, after going through two years of pretty much staying COVID-free, we've had a bunch of people at one time in the hospital for that. Um, this place is sanitized, by the way, and ozone, you know, has been put on, what, yesterday, I believe, and we sanitize and everything. But it was just all of a sudden, it just hit us all at once. And I believe Pastor Jimmy spoke about it last week about that dream where he felt like he was under attack or the church was under attack or whatnot. And then, you know, on top of that, um, there's, there's just a bunch of different examples. I've had people call me this week out of the blue dealing with suicide. And so it's just been one of those weeks. And, and you just don't want to talk about suffering at the end of that week. But the Lord was like, no, I want you to talk about this. And I'm like, no, God, I don't want to talk about this. He's like, yes, talk about this. You know, one of those moments. And I've struggled with this topic. But again, I hope, you know, as the Holy Spirit ministers to you guys on this topic, and he speaks through me, that heaven's perspective will come out of this. And before we start, we've got to have a foundation And the foundation is this, that whenever we get outside of the context of family, we are leaving God's kingdom. We've got to have that deep in our hearts this morning. I can't go forward until you tell me you've got that. Because God's perspective is all about family. Family first. The kingdom of God is about family. When you leave that, you can get yourself in all sorts of trouble. All sorts of theological trouble. Trying to explain scriptures to people outside of that context is absolutely wrong when describing Jesus or the Father. And I'll give an example, and I've given this many times, that the number one reason that Jesus came here to earth, there's only one reason, one number one reason. Everybody says, oh, salvation, die on the cross. No, these were a byproduct of this number one reason. Jesus said and did nothing that he didn't see the Father doing. This was the Father's will for his Son to come. And the heart behind it was for Jesus to come to an orphan planet and display and look like and sound like a father to a bunch of orphans. That was the number one reason. So again, we can't, and out of that came salvation. Out of that came the cross. The number one reason was because the father wanted Jesus to display who he was, what he sounded like, what he looked like, what his heart was like. So when you get outside of the context of family, when you're trying to preach or teach, then you're outside of the kingdom. Everybody with me? Everybody got that? All right. Now, there's a lot of dynamics in family. We still correct in the family, don't we? Yeah, we love in the family, right? We go after people. We pursue in the family. There's all kind of dynamics in the family, but it's a family context. So that's heaven's perspective, and we got to keep that in mind. So I want to talk a little bit today about sufferings, persecutions, and testings. John 10.10 says the enemy comes to steal and destroy, but I come to give life and life more abundantly. So when Jesus says, I come to give life, I've got to believe that. I've got to believe that. Life was his agenda. That was the heart of the Father was to bring life. It's a shame that there's so many people in churches today that will focus on, they won't focus on the people that Jesus healed or came in front of him, but they would rather focus and write about the ones that weren't healed. How many times, 
at the pool of Bethesda have I heard that, you know, it's not said, it's not said this in Scripture. It's not at all. This is just people thinking this way. The pool of Bethesda had a lot of crippled people around it all the time, supposedly. But one person, when Jesus entered into that, one person stepped, well, not stepped forward, I don't think they could walk, but came forward and was like, hey, I want to be healed. Now, we don't know if the other ones were like, get out of here, we're waiting on the angel to stir the water or whatnot. We don't know. The Bible doesn't say, but you have books written about all the other people supposedly that was there. We don't know if it was morning, night, it was empty, one guy was there early in the morning. We don't know, but there's books written about all the people Jesus supposedly did not heal at that pool. Just one guy. But yet we see his character and nature is what? To heal everybody he came into contact with. Everybody. That's his character. That's his nature. That's family. What would you do for your brother and sister? So again, we can't get outside that context. That's his heart. That's his nature. To heal. Even people that were not Jews at that time. When he said, it's not my time. To be with you, I'm called to the lost house of Israel. It's not my time yet to heal you. There's somebody later on going to be raised up to minister to you Gentiles. But the Phoenician woman came and pleaded and he healed her. What does that say? What does that say? It's the heart and nature of our Heavenly Father being displayed through our Jesus. That he didn't turn anybody away. So is there sufferings in the will of God? Absolutely. Is there persecution in the will of God? Absolutely. Is there testing in the will of God? Absolutely. Is there sickness in that suffering? No. God does not cause sickness. There's a difference between suffering and sickness. God doesn't cause sickness. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus came to blow up sickness and get rid of it. So we today have got to separate suffering and sickness. We can't lump it together. I hear so many people talk about that. So many people, well, it must be God's will. I'm suffering with this sickness. And it says in the Bible that those who know Christ must suffer. So I must be in God's will because I'm sick today. No, you're not. There's a difference there's a huge difference. <clears throat> Let's go to the first scripture. Please, John. Let's go to the first scripture, please. There we go. All right. But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed and do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. What is it saying here? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, what does it say? What does the Bible say in context about righteousness today for the New Testament believer? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We leave that out. Let's seek the kingdom of God and all else will be given unto us. They leave out his righteousness. Why is his righteousness in with the kingdom of God? Seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness and all shall be added unto you. We cannot leave that out. That's huge. We've got to focus. That's a focal point. His righteousness. Why? Why his righteousness? Because Romans 5.17 says, How much more will those receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of his righteousness to reign in this life? You understand? When you understand that his righteousness, because of the cross, has now, he's taken your filthy righteousness and he's traded with you. He's given you 
His righteousness is a gift. We receive now through faith. So just like we've received our salvation and we can boldly stand up and go, by faith, I believe I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, without a shadow of a doubt. How many people in here can stand up right now and say, I have received the gift of righteousness by faith and I boldly believe it and I will not backstep on that. So you know what that entails. If you are his righteousness, you are to reign in life. Reign in this life, not the life to come. Reign in this life. His righteousness means you are now in right standing before the Father. You now, because of his righteousness that you have by faith, you can stand before the throne of God. That's what that means. You can now spiritually talk to your heavenly Father. You don't have to go kill animals and go into the Holy of Holies and go do all that anymore. The veil's been torn. The separation is gone. And if you are operating in His righteousness, guess what? By faith, there's no sickness. There's no disease. These are big statements. But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. Now, why? Why would you suffer for the sake of righteousness? Why would that even be in here? Do not fear the intimidation. Do not be troubled. Why? Because people that see you operating on a level of anointing like this, and operating and in, in, in knowing who you are as sons and daughters, do you not think they're not going to be jealous? Do you not think that, that there's going to be circumstances in front of you, challenges in front of you in this world because of that? This is the suffering in context it's talking about when you know who you are. But if you know who you are, you should rise above these things. You should be able to cut right through these things. When you see an obstacle, it's not so that you turn around and run away from it. When you see an obstacle, us as Christians should run towards it. Because we know we're going to overpower it. So yes, there is suffering. The God of this world is who? The devil. He says he's the God of this world. He didn't create this world. He is the God of this world, the prince of the power of the air. He's roaming around seeking whom he can devour. That's his goal. He has an authority given to him in this world. That's why in this world we wield the name of Jesus now because every knee has to submit underneath that name in this world. Every name. I also want to pay... Now, we're going to be asking the hard questions today. These are hard scriptures. People don't like to go here. And I, I am... Show me where people are willing to, to tackle these scriptures because these are very difficult ones. And, and most of the time, you have an apologetic Bible that people buy because they just don't understand some of these things in Scripture. And I feel like the Lord has really kind of like hook, line, and sinkered me into these questions to share His heart. And I don't think you have this Scripture, so we'll just stay right there. But it's in Luke 13. I don't think I gave it to you, John. I think it's something I added this morning. And thank you, John, for always being so diligent again with putting these scriptures up. And let's give him a round of applause. Everything they do in the sound booth, everybody, Brandon, Elliot, just putting these scriptures up all the time and uh, making sure everything's right. But in Luke 13, I have now on the same occasion, there were some present who reported to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Now, what had happened was there was a reported a number of Galileans that went to 
I guess, into the city, and there were some things that they disrupted, some things that they did, and Pilate slayed them. Pontius Pilate killed them. These upright, devout men, I guess. I don't know. But Pilate massacred them. So this is a talk that's going around right now. And Jesus said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or do you not suppose that those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them were worse culprits than all the men who lived in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will likewise perish. What's going on here? To put this in context, the mindset of the Jewish men back then were what? That these men went into the city and they must have done something wrong in God's eyes, so God killed them. God allowed Pilate to kill them. This is the question being presented to Jesus. And he said no twice. No. No. That's not what happened. No and no. Again, this establishes the heart of the Heavenly Father. How about the sons of thunder that wanted to take and call down fire and eradicate a whole entire village? Right? I was called a son of thunder not too long ago. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor Diego. Yeah, we had, we went into evangelizing this grocery store and he tried to put the owner in the headlock and me and Jimmy had to get him and pull him out and then, you know, get him out here. And he's like, you sons of thunder. No, that's not what happened. Not at all. It was the other way around. You guys have already heard the story. I got in trouble. I did it. OK, so um, that's not what happened. But anyway, so it's not the heart behind it. And they wanted to basically commit genocide. Eradicate a whole village. And Jesus is like, you do not know what you're asking. So again, these, these disciples that were walking with him were like, hey, what's going on here? First Peter... What's the next scripture, John? There we go. 1 Peter 4, 1 through 4. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourself also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Wait a second. What? So there's another type of suffering now, right? Because of righteousness, but yet there's another type of suffering that will make me cease from sin? Well, let me tell you, that is so true. That is so true. I'm telling you, I'll tell you one of the biggest obstacles that will really get you thinking is finances. Because if you don't have finances, a way to you know, communicate in this world, not use that as your God... But, you know, you have one God, but use that as a servant and you don't know and nobody's been there to teach you. Imagine when because of your dumb choices. You have no finances and there's people that are suffering because of your dumb choices. Can you say that at that point, either you're going to wise up? You're going to call on the grace and mercy of God to get you out of this situation, and you're going to learn from that, and you're going to be better off when you come up out of that hole and that situation. Can you say that that's happened? Does that happen to anybody else? I know it's happened to me. I mean, there's red flags put in place where I say I will never do that again. I see where that pit that, that leads to. You know what I mean? And what does that come out of? That comes out of what? Suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin in that area. I see that pitfall 
no, sir, spend some time down in that hole. I'm out of it now. I see it. So, so when you see it, you're like, you turn this way. That's wisdom from being down in that hole. You've ceased from sin. So as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for lusts of men, but for the will of God. For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desires of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking, partying, and <laughs> abominable idolatries. And all this, they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excess of dispensation, and they malign you. All right? So, what's going on here? What else happens? What else happens? You lay in that pig pen for a while. Prodigal son laid in that pig pen until he came to his senses. And again, this is family. This is family. The prodigal son decided to leave the house of the father. He decided to leave the family and the safety of the family and go out on his own and lay in that pit lay in that gutter, do stupid things, make stupid mistakes, suffer, lay in the pig pen and suffer until he said, I'm going to sin no more. I've come to my senses. I want out of this pit and I'm going back to dad's house. And when dad saw him, dad jumped off the porch and ran to him. Do we see the picture of family? We see the context of family, kingdom family. So, yes, there is a suffering that will make you stop sinning. There is. Discipline. I don't have time to go into all that, but the Lord disciplines in Hebrews, disciplines his sons and daughters in whom he loves. And sometimes that one of those forms of discipline is to turn you over to your own devices and let you suffer and lay in a pig pen till you decide to come back home. I've got someone now that is an age old friend of mine that's talking about suicide. Every other text, he's tired of this, but yet he's been around the same mountain 47 years doing the same thing. Over and over expecting a different result. And he just doesn't understand how to get out of that pit. Because he keeps doing the same thing to get himself in there. Next verse. All right, John 9. And as he passed by, this is Jesus. Look at where Jesus' focus is. It wasn't the disciples. Let's get this. As he passed by, he, capital he, that's Jesus, saw a man blind from birth. This is a hard scripture. These are one of these hard scriptures. We're going to go through hard scriptures today that no one wants to tackle. He saw a blind man from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? Again, this mindset that these guys got slaughtered, and, the, and that tower of Shalom fell on them because there was some kind of sin, and God was taking them out. Right? So here's this mindset again. He saw a blind man from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, and he would be, um, that he would be born blind? Now, well, we'll just keep going. Jesus answered, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Now, let's stop right there. Look how Jesus changes this. They want a cause. They are pressing him for a cause. Why? 
Why is this man like this? Why does he why is this happening to him? Jesus, what was the cause? We want a cause. We want a cause. And look what he does. He flips the script on him and he tells him it was because there was a divine encounter supposed to happen here where light meets darkness in this world. Not that he calls this man to be blind from birth, but yet he's making this in context that light is now here in a dark world. And in a dark world, people are born blind. In a dark world, people are born, born death. And there's a divine appointment here fixing to happen for the glory of God. That I'm encountering this individual right now. Salvation is here. Healing is here. So he changes it from a cause they want to know a cause to a divine appointment, destiny, your purpose. How much more your purpose? How much more my purpose? When he says your job is to bring about the kingdom of God here on earth, you now are supposed to be that light in a dark world. How many blind men and blind women out there are waiting for you to walk up on them? Not that God ordained their blindness or that. No, it's a byproduct of being in a dark world. But now you, how many people are waiting for you to walk up on them and say, be healed in the name of Jesus? To make that change, because we're called to be change agents. To bring the kingdom of God here. So this is the picture of what's going on here nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed. The works, the works might be displayed. We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Heaven come to earth. That's the perspective. Cause versus divine appointment, destiny, divine setup. Think about that. That's how cool Jesus is. That's how cool the Heavenly Father is. And I love how Jesus didn't answer their questions. He was just so up and above their questions. They want call. How many other people wouldn't want? We'd all be just, we'd fit right in that category. Jesus, why? Why is this happening? Jesus, why? 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 What happened here? So I don't, I know not to never do it. Tell me why. Why? Why? Okay. Next scripture. First Peter five eight. Now, how many people know that there is such thing as suffering through a siege, through an attack, physical attack? Now, there's times where I've got my own self in trouble, and I've had to figure out how to get out of the pit, and I've suffered to the point of obedience like Jesus and learned from it, All right? There's been times I've been operating in an anointing like the Lord and I've suffered from it from the religious spirits in the area. that have tried to shut me down, say that's not God, blaspheme my name, change the whole church service, come in and cause divisions like we've been discussing. These are all types of suffering. Now look at this. This is another type of suffering that you need to learn. Okay? Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experience of sufferings are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. After you've suffered for a little while, the God of grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. 
So let me ask you a question. How many people remember when the Spirit of God led Jesus into the wilderness? Now, get this. If you read in Matthew 3, the Father spoke over Jesus. There's, there's a difference between rhema word and logos word. Rhema word is the spoken word of God. Logos word is the written word of God. That's an easy way to remember it. Logos is the written word. The Bible is the written word of God. Okay? When you hear a prophetic word, that's the rhema word of God. All right? So, here we have the rhema word of God being spoken over him. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. You have the Father literally speaking to Jesus in chapter 3. 4 1, Matthew 4 1. Jesus goes into the wilderness being led by the Spirit of God into the wilderness, and the Father is not speaking. The Father is silent for 40 days. And guess what happens? There's an all-out assault on Jesus. Someone trying to siege his castle. Someone trying to take from him. Did the Father run in and say, hey, son, just say this? No, Father was silent. Jesus had to combat the enemy out of the scripture that he had already stored up in his heart. How many people here, when you get into that that place where you're being attacked by the enemy, can just quote the scripture at him without having to hear a word from the Lord or having to get an answer from God or having to pray through this situation or having to say, Daddy, speak to me. How many people at that point when they're being attacked can just turn around and throw Scripture back at him until he leaves? Anybody here? That's the point I'm trying to make. There is sieges that come from the enemy. There is attacks that come from the enemy that cause great suffering. But you've got to realize what it is and who it is. And this is where it says, have your senses be trained to know good from evil. And you've got to discern who's attacking you, what's happening, and how to combat that enemy. This is another form of suffering. Now, so far, am I drawing the line between sickness and suffering? Right? I'm showing you guys, right, in context, what kind of suffering the Bible talks about you're going to be a part of. Have I added sickness to that? Not at all. That's my goal here today. Let's remove sickness from that. Colossians 1, 23. If indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not move away from the hope of the gospel, you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, was made a minister. Look at that. Paul was made a minister. Now I rejoice in my sufferings. Pay attention to that word. Paul and I've, I counted so far up to 30 different scriptures that have to do with suffering. Paul is like, rejoice. Can you say there's a key there? Can you say that the, like the weapon formed against suffering is rejoicing? And, and, and get this correct in your head today. Most people think, well, I have to find joy, something joyful about, in order to get joy. No, that's unbiblical. Get that programming out of your head. The biblical worldview is you get joyful in order to receive joy, which there eradicates suffering. But you can't have suffering and joy in the same house. You getting this? You got it? So... You say, well, there's nothing to be joyful about. It don't matter. Get in there. Start singing. Start dancing. Start getting joyful, and then you will find joy. Now, I rejoice in my sufferings for the sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, and filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. 
Of this church, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit, so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. So, I wrote up here in my notes, Paul's sufferings are giving the church amazing insight and direction. Through what he suffered, it has allowed the church to be established. This is stuff the Lord was just giving me. The more they sacrificed, the more they suffered, the church would be established. Think about that, the assignment that was on Paul as a minister called to the church. Think of the assignment, the level of anointing that was on this guy. This guy knew suffering. This guy knew suffering like the back of his hand, but also he knew the revelations that it manifested. He also knew the anointing that suffering would give him. He also knew that declaring his weaknesses, the strength that he would get from that. This is a man of suffering, but he's bragging about that. The suffering that he went through took him from level to level, from ceiling to ceiling to ceiling. This guy had such a high calling, a high mantle on his life, given to him a high anointing from the Lord all through suffering. The Bible says he was given a messenger of Satan to buffet. The word buffet means to war against his flesh, to stop him, to try and hurt him. From going forward, he had such revelation and power on his words. And when he said something, it happened like that. Peter, the same way, his shadow healed people when he walked by. Can you imagine the level of suffering they went went through to cultivate this type of anointing? For that type of assignment. This is crazy. But yet, we see a picture of this. Where are we at? Colossians. All right. So we see a picture of this. In 1 Corinthians 5, 3 through 5. For I, on my part, though absent in the body, but present in spirit, have already judged him. There was a man that was committing adultery in the church, sleeping with his father's wife. So the father had died. I don't know. I think the father had died, or maybe not. Maybe had not died. Maybe he was just... A man was sleeping with another, his father's wife in the church, and he was not wanting to leave the church. So Paul, I, on my part, though absent in body but present in the spirit, have already judged him. Now, does it say God judged him? Paul. So what is this telling us? Paul had this high level of anointing on him, this mantle, to where when Paul said things, they happened. who had committed this, and though I were present in the name of the Lord Jesus, when you are assembled and I with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, I have decided to deliver such one to Satan. He said the power of my Lord Jesus, this is what he's doing this with. Operating in this level of apostolic anointing. He's not even there. But yet he declares that somebody hundreds of miles away that their body be delivered over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh so that their soul will be saved. Does this sound like family? Context? Not really. I can't even begin. Now, this is a hard verse. I can't even begin to go there and think about that. Me and Pastor Jimmy were sitting here going... Man, we just go talk to the dude and give him another chance and try to talk to him. Not Paul. Paul's like, send him over to Satan. Let his body be destroyed. And it happened to this guy. 
That's that high level of anointing of apostolic leadership this guy's walking in. He did it. It's crazy. Next verse, Acts 5. Ananias and Sapphira. Ananias and Sapphira were supposed to sell their property, husband and wife, and give the proceeds to the church. They both agreed to steal a percentage of the money from the church after God had told them to give what they had in property to the church. High level anointing here. I can't even begin to describe it. Dropping down into verse 9. The husband had already died. The husband had already come and lied to Peter. And Peter said, because you've stolen and you've lied to the Spirit of God, you're now dead. Peter said this to him. And this man drops dead. High level apostolic anointing going on here. I don't even understand it. This guy drops dead. Fast forward to his wife. And Peter said to her, she comes in three hours later, why is it that you have agreed together to put the spirit of the Lord to the test? Because she lied to him too. Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out as well. And immediately she fell at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came over the whole church and over all who heard these things. Now, it's interesting in verse 12. Verse 12 immediately says this. At the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place. What's the context here? Apostolic anointing on Peter. At the hands of the apostolic, many signs and wonders were taking place. This happened to be one of them. Think about that. Because a lot of people will throw this scripture back in your face and Paul's scripture back in your face that Jesus wanted people dead. These are hard scriptures to deal with. Hebrews 2.10. It's pretty late, isn't it? Getting there? How many more? I only have two more scriptures, maybe. Let me look. Nope. It's like five. Anyhow, well, real quick, let's just go to um, 2 Timothy 3.12. Okay, I'll get off sufferings. Real quick, 2 Timothy 3.12, indeed, all who, now this is persecution I'm talking about. We just talked about suffering. We talked about high-level apostolic leaders and what they can do and the decisions they can make. All right? So we went through all different types of suffering um, that's here in this world and why it's written in the Bible. Sickness is not associated with it. Now we're looking at persecution. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. How are you persecuted? But evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse. So men and women, listen, when Jesus died on the cross, he redeemed everything back to us besides suffering and persecution because we still have one foot in this world and people are going to be jealous and people are going to kind of blaspheme your name. People are going to come forth and persecute you because you're sitting there saying, I'm a Christian. And persecution will follow. So we got to understand this. Suffering and persecution. Next scripture, James 1.13. I'm going through them fast. Tested, not tempted. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted. By evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. There's no temptations given to you by God. None. 
Absolutely none. First Peter 1, 4 through 8. To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through the faith of salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. This is the verse, verse 6. And this you greatly, here it is, greatly rejoice. Even though now for a little while, if necessary, what? You have been distressed with various trials, so that the proof of your what? Faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though what? Tested by fire may be found to result in praise, and there it is again, praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What is it saying here? It is saying that proof of your faith and the tested by fire. Guess what gets you through those things? It's right there at the end, the answer. And that's my last verse. You want to come up, Pastor Jimmy? What is that saying? Tested by fire. We're going to go through trials. And we're tested by fire. Why? Until we come to the full knowledge of the revelation of who he is. Well, what about him? The goodness of God. That's what it's about. The goodness of God. Do you know how many times I'm in fire? Do you know how many times I'm being tested? And do you want to know how I get out of those fires and those tests? I get out of those fires, which are melting away all the impurities. I get out of them when I come to the revelation of how good he is. And when I start to get my head right, even though the fire is burning me up, nothing's going my way, circumstances are horrible, I'm in that pit, I'm in that fire, I'm being squeezed. I get my mind, I stop, I start to be joyful, and I get my mind right that he's a good, good father. And guess what? The fire ceases, and I come up out of there. And I get another revelation on how good he really is. Heaven's perspective. Hope you guys enjoyed it.